Hello, everyone. The last reading was quite a shouty one. I'll try to dial it down this time. That is to say, if I don't get too excited while reading, which I often do, and quite forget that I'm recording. Anyways, let's get back to Moby Dick, by Herman Melville. The Prophet. Shipmates, have you shipped in that ship? Quick Quig and I had just left the Picquod, and were sauntering away from the water, for the moment each occupied with his own thoughts, when the above words were put to us by a stranger, who, pausing before us, leveled his massive forefinger at the vessel in question. He was but shabbily apparelled in faded jacket and patched trousers, a rag of a black handkerchief investing his neck. A confluent smallpox had in all directions flowed over his face and left it like the complicated ribbed bed of a torrent when the rushing waters have been dried up. Have you shipped in her? He repeated. You mean the ship Pequod, I suppose? Said I, trying to gain a little more time for an uninterrupted look at him. Ay, the Pequod, that ship there, he said, drawing back his whole arm, and then rapidly shoving it straight out from him, with the fixed bayonet of his pointed finger darted full at the object. Yes, said I. We have just signed the articles. Anything down there about your souls? What about? Oh, perhaps you haven't got any, he said quickly. No matter, though. I know many chaps who haven't got any. Good luck to em, and they are all the better off for it. A soul's a sort of a fifth wheel to a wagon. What are you jabbering about, shipmate? said I. He's got enough, though, to make up for all deficiencies of that sort in other chaps, abruptly said the stranger, placing a nervous emphasis upon the word he. Quick, quick, said I. Let's go. This fellow has broken loose from somewhere. He's talking about something and somebody we don't know. Stop, cried the stranger. You said true. You haven't seen old thunder yet, have ye? Who's old thunder? Said I, again riveted with the insane earnestness of his manner. Captain Ahab. What? The captain of our ship, the Pequod? Aye. Among some of us old sailor chaps he goes by that name. You haven't seen him yet, have ye? No, we haven't. He's sick, they say, but is getting better, and will be all right again before long. All right again before long, laughed the stranger, with a solemnly derisive sort of laugh. Look here, yeah, when Captain Ahab is all right, then this left arm of mine will be all right, not before. What do you know about him? What did they tell you about him? Say that. They didn't tell me much of anything about him, only I've heard that he's a good whale hunter and a good captain to his crew. That's true, that's true. Yes, both true enough. But you must jump when he gives an order. Step and growl, growl and go. That's the word with Captain Ahab. But nothing about that thing that happened to him off Cape Horn long ago when he lay like dead for three days and nights. Nothing about that deadly scrimmage with the Spaniard afore the altar in Santa. Heard nothing about that, eh? Nothing about the silver calabash he spat into, and nothing about his losing his leg last voyage, according to the prophecy. Didn't ye hear a word about the matters and something more, eh? No, I didn't think you did. How could ye? Who knows it? Not all Nanticket, I guess. But howsoever, mayhap we've heard 
Tell about the leg and how he lost it, eh? You have heard of that, I dare say. Oh yes, that. Everyone knows almost. I mean, they know his only one leg and that Parmesetti took the other off. My friend, said I, what all this gibberish is about, I don't know, and I don't much care, for it seems to me that you must be a little damaged in the head. But if you are speaking of Captain Ahab, of that ship there, the Piquod, then let me tell you that I know all about the loss of his leg. All about it, eh? Sure you do? All? Pretty sure. With finger pointed and eye leveled at the Piquod, the beggar-like stranger stood a moment, as if in troubled reverie, then starting a little, turned and said, You have shipped, have you? Names down on the papers? Well, well. What's signed is signed, and what's to be will be. And then again, perhaps it won't be after all. Anyhow, it's all fixed and arranged already. And some sailors or other must go with him, I suppose. As well, these as any other men. God pity him. Morning to ye, shipmates, morning. The ineffable heavens bless ye. I'm sorry I stopped ye. Look here, friend, said I. If you have anything important to tell us, out with it. But if you are only trying to bamboozle us, you are mistaken in your game. That's all I have to say. And it's said very well. And I like to hear a chap talk up that way. You are just the man for him, the likes of you. Morning to you. Shipmates, morning. Oh, when you get there, tell him I've concluded not to make one of them. Ah, uh, my dear fellow, you can't fool us that way. You can't fool us. It is the easiest thing in the world for a man to look as if he had a great secret in him. Morning to your shipmates. Morning. Morning it is, said I. Come along, quick, quick. Let's leave this crazy man. But stop. Tell me your name, will you? Elijah. Elijah, thought I, and we walked away, both commenting after each other's fashion upon this ragged old sailor, and agreed that he was nothing but a humbug, trying to be a bugbear. But we had not gone perhaps about a hundred yards, when chancing to turn a corner, and looking back, as I did so, who should be seen but Elijah following us, though at a distance. Somehow the sight of him struck me so that I said nothing to Quickwig of his being behind, but passed on with my comrade, anxious to see whether the stranger would turn the same corner that we did. He did, and then it seemed to me that he was dogging us, but with what intent I could not for the life of me imagine. This circumstance, coupled with his ambiguous, half-hinting, half-revealing, shrouded sort of talk, now begat in me all kinds of vague wonderments and half-apprehensions, and all connected with the Picod, and Captain Ahab, and the leg he had lost, and the Cape Hornfit, and the Silver Calabash, and what Captain Peleg had said of him, when I left the ship the day previous, and the prediction of the Scotistig, and the voyage we had bound ourselves to sail, and a hundred other shadowy things. I was resolved to satisfy myself whether this ragged Elijah was really dogging us or not, and with that intent crossed the way with Quickwig, and on that side of it retraced our steps. But Elijah passed on, without seeming to notice us. This relieved me, and once more, and finally as it seemed to me, I pronounced him, in my heart, a humbug. All austere. A day or two passed, and there was great activity aboard the Picode, 
Not only were the old sails being mended, but new sails were coming on board, and bolts of canvas and coils of rigging. In short, everything betokened that the ship's preparations were hurrying to a close. I'm really sorry about the dogs, but, well, they're dogs, it's fine. They'll bark. It's just street dogs crowding the streets, and after midnight they go a little crazy. Captain Peleg seldom or never went ashore, but sat in his wigwam keeping a sharp lookout upon the hands. Bildad did all the purchasing and providing at the stores, and the men employed in the hold and on the rigging were working till long after nightfall. On the day following Quickwig signing the articles, word was given at all the inns where the ship's company were stopping, that their chests must be on board before night, for there was no telling how soon the vessel might be sailing. So Quickwig and I got down our traps, resolving, however, to sleep ashore till the last. But it seems they always give very long notices in these cases, and the ship did not sail for several days. But no wonder. There was a good deal to be done, and there is no telling how many things to be thought of before the Piquod was fully equipped. Everyone knows what a multitude of things, beds, saucepans, knives and forks, shovels and tongs, napkins, nutcrackers and what not, are indispensable to the business of housekeeping. Just so with whaling, which necessitates a three years housekeeping upon the wide ocean, far from all grocers, costermongers, doctors, bakers and bankers. And though this also holds true of merchant vessels, yet not by any means to the same extent as with whalemen. For besides the great length of the whaling voyage, the numerous articles peculiar to the pros prosecution of the fishery, and the impossibility of replacing them at the remote harbours usually frequented, it must be remembered that, of all ships, whaling vessels are the most exposed to accidents of all kinds, and especially to the destruction and loss of the very things upon which the success of the voyage most depends. Hence, the spare boats, spare spars, and spare lines and harpoons, and spare everything almost, but a spare captain and duplicate ship. At the period of our arrival at the island, the heaviest storage of the Piquod had been almost completed, comprising her beef, bread, water, fuel, and iron hoops and staves. But as before hinted, for some time there was a continual fetching and carrying on board of divers odds and ends, both large and small. Chief among those who did this fetching and carrying was Captain Bildad's sister, a lean old lady of a most determined and indefatigable spirit. But withal very kind-hearted, who seemed resolved that if she could help it, nothing should be found wanting in the Piquod, after once fairly getting to sea. At one time she would come on board with a jar of pickles for the steward's pantry, another time with a bunch of quilts for the chief mate's desk, where he kept his log, a third time with a roll of flannel for the small of someone's rheumatic back. Never did any woman better deserve her name, which was Charity, Aunt Charity, as everybody called her. And like a sister of Charity did this charitable Aunt Charity bustle about thither and hither, ready to turn her hand and heart to do anything that promised to yield safety, comfort and consolation to all on board a ship in which her beloved brother Bildad was concerned, and in which she herself owned a score or two of whale-saved dollars. But it was startling to see this excellent-hearted Quakeress coming on board, as she did the last day with a long oil ladle in one hand and a still longer whaling lance in the other. Nor was Bildad himself nor Captain Peleg at all backward. As for Bildad, he carried about him a long list of the articles needed 
and at every fresh arrival, down went his mark opposite that article upon the paper. Every once in a while, Peleg came hobbling out of his whalebone den, roaring at the men down the hatchways, roaring up to the riggers at the masthead, and then concluded by roaring back into his wigwam. During these days of preparation, Quickwig and I often visited the craft, and as often, I asked about Captain Ahab and how he was, and when he was going to come on board this ship. To these questions they would answer, that he was getting better and better, and was expected abroad every day. Meantime the two captains, Peleg and Bildad, could attend to everything necessary to fit the vessel for the voyage. If I had been downright honest with myself, I would have seen very plainly in my heart that I did but half fancy being committed this way to so long a voyage, without once laying my eyes on the man who was to be the absolute dictator of it, so soon as the ship sailed out upon the open sea. But when a man suspects any wrong, it sometimes happens that, if he be already involved in the matter, he incessantly strives to cover up his suspicions, even from himself. And much this way it was with me, I said nothing, and tried to think nothing. At last it was given out that sometime next day the ship would certainly sail. So next morning, Quickwig and I took a very early start. Going aboard It was nearly six o'clock, but only grey imperfect misty dawn when we drew nigh the wharf. There are some sailors running ahead there, if I see right, said I to Quick Quig. It can't be shadows. She's off by sunrise, I guess. Come on. Avast, cried a voice, whose owner, at the same time coming close behind us, laid a hand upon both our shoulders and then, insinuating himself between us, stood stooping forward a little in the uncertain twilight, strangely peering from Quick Quick to me. It was Elijah. Going aboard? Hands off, will you? said I. Looky here, said Quick Quick, shaking himself. Go away. Ain't going aboard then? Yes, we are, said I. But what business is that of yours? Do you know, Mr. Eliza, that I consider you a little impertinent? No, 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 I wasn't aware of that, said Elijah, slowly and wonderingly looking from me to Quickwig with the most unaccountable glances. Elijah, said I, you will oblige my friend and me by withdrawing. We are going to the Indian and Pacific Oceans, and would prefer not to be detained. Ye be, be ye? Coming back from breakfast? He's cracked, Quig Quig, said I. Come on. Halloa! cried stationary Elijah, hailing us when we had removed a few paces. Never mind him said I. Quick, quick, come on. But he stole up to us again, and suddenly, clapping his hand on my shoulder, said, Did you see anything looking like men going towards that ship a while ago? Struck by this plain matter-of-fact question, I answered, saying, Yes, I thought I did see four or five men, but it was too dim to be sure. Very dim, very dim said Elijah. Morning to ye. Once more we quitted him, but once more he came softly after us, and touching my shoulder again said, See if you can find them, will ye? Find who? Morning to ye, morning to ye, he rejoined, again moving off. Ah! Oh. I was going to warn you against, but never mind, never mind. It's all one, all in the family too. Sharp frost this morning, ain't it? Goodbye to ye. 
Shan't see ya again very soon, I guess. Unless it's before the grand jury. And with these cracked words, he finally departed, leaving me, for the moment, in no small wonderment at his frantic impudence. At last, stepping on board the Picode, we found everything in profound quiet, not a soul moving. The cabin entrance was locked within, the hatches were all on, and lumbered with coils of rigging. Going forward to the forecastle, we found the slide of the scuttle open. Seeing a light, we went down and found only an old rigger there, wrapped in a tattered pea jacket. He was thrown at whole length upon two chests, his face downwards and enclosed in his folded arms. The profoundest slumber slept upon him. Those sailors we saw, Quickwig, where can they have gone to? said I, looking dubiously at the sleeper. But it seemed that, when on the wharf, Quickwig had not at all noticed what I now alluded to. Hence, I would have thought myself to have been optically deceived in that matter, were it not for Elijah's otherwise inexplicable question. But I beat the thing down, and again, marking the sleeper, jocularly hinted to Quickwig that perhaps we had best sit up with the body, telling him to establish himself accordingly. He put his hand upon his sleeper's rear as though feeling it, feeling if it were soft enough, and then, without more ado, sat quietly down there. Gracious, quick, quick, don't sit there, said I. Oh, very good seat, said quick, quick. My country way. Won't hurt him face. Face, said I. Call that his face? Very benevolent countenance then. But how hard he breathes. He's heaving himself. Get off quick quick. You are heavy. It's grinding, grinding the face off the poor. Get off quick quick. Look, he'll twitch you off soon. I wonder he don't wake. Quick Quig removed himself to just beyond the head of the sleeper and lighted his tomahawk pipe. I sat at the feet. We kept the pipe passing over the sleeper, from one to the other. Meanwhile, upon questioning him in his broken fashion, Quick Quig gave me to understand that in his land, owing to the absence of cities and sofas of all sorts, the king, chiefs, and great people generally were in the custom of fattening some of the lower orders of Ottomans and to furnish a house comfortably in that respect. You had only to buy up eight or ten lazy fellows and lay them around in the piers and alcoves. Besides, it was very convenient on an excursion much better than those garden chairs which are convertible into walking sticks. Upon occasion, a chief calling his attendant and desiring him to make a settee of himself under a spreading tree, perhaps in some damp, marshy place. While narrating these things, every time Quick Quig received the tomahawk from me, he flourished the hatchet side of it over the sleeper's head. What's that for, Quick Quig? Very easy. Kili. Oh, very easy. He was going on with some wild reminiscences about his tomahawk pipe, which, it seemed, had in its two uses both brained his foes and soothed his soul when we were directly attracted to the sleeping rigor. The strong vapor now completely filling the contracted hole, it began to tell upon him. He breathed with a sort of muffledness, then seemed troubled in the nose, then revolved over once or twice, then sat up and rubbed his eyes. Hulloa! He breathed at last. Who be a smokers? Shipped men, answered I. When does she sail? I, I, ye are going in her, be ye? She sails today. The captain came aboard last night. What? 
Captain Ahab? Who but him indeed? I was going to ask him some further questions concerning Ahab when we heard a noise on deck. Halloa, Starbucks astir, said the rigger. He's a lively chief mate, that good man, and a pious. But all alive now, I must turn to. And so saying, he went on deck, and we followed. It was now clear sunrise. Soon the crew came on board, in twos and threes. The riggers bestirred themselves, the mates were actively engaged, and several of the shore people were busy in bringing various last things on board. Meanwhile, Captain Ahab remained invisibly enshrined within his cabin. Well, the next chapter is quite long, and I think I'll start from there in the next reading. Till then, stay well, everyone, be safe, and thanks a ton for listening. Hadabra.